All right, guys, what we're going to do is uh, uh, DEF CON's always played spot the Fed, right? How many of you have spotted a Fed before? None of you. Okay. You're all fucking lying. <laughs> what the fuck are we doing up here? You know? Anyway, okay, here comes Priest. What we're going to do is Priest is going to pick on, or not, pick out what he looks, what looks like a lamer. And we're going to play spot the lamer, and you guys in the audience are going to determine who the lamer is. So, Priest, please, uh, you know, pick out some. Uh, Watch Full Metal Jacket. Stand up, sir. <laughs> come on down, Private Snowball. C come on down, sir. No, no, don't sit down. Is that you? Ted, stand up. Sit down. I didn't say Simon said. Stand back up. Let's see how many times we can do this. Oh, there we go. Uncle Sam's misguided children. Okay, what I was saying was, we apologize, we are trying some new things in terms of crowd control. Obviously, it's not working this morning. We apologize. We do take your suggestions to heart. We do try to correct the problems that we find. Obviously, the one we have right now is not working. We are also having a, is anyone here from DHS? Next panel is DHS and I can talk about them since they're not here. It's a DHS experiment. It's to find terrorists. So if the guy next to you is not sweating out in the hall, probably a terrorist. <laughs> Turn him in. I know that you're not sweating, Jim. <laughs> um, like Jim explained, we're gonna do the uh, spot the lamer. So I'm gonna walk amongst you and basically pick people out. about five or six. Just line up right here, please. Right out in front, where everybody can see you. Priest, you're doing a good job. I don't think we need to go any further. These guys look pretty lean. Or we'll kill you.
Hey, Priest, there are some more gals over here. More gals. That's good, priest. Thank you. You want to ask the first question? Nah? Okay, we're going to number you guys. Look at me. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, number one. The question is, where do you store your porn? <laughs> and you have to answer loudly. Lamer. <laughs> John. You often, which one? Uh, two. Do you often find yourself referring to anime characters as hot? <laughs> Use the microphone, guys. Not you. <laughs> All right, number three. What does RBN stand for? Lamer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not telling you. Go ahead. Trent. Number four. Have you ever had a lightsaber fight in public? Number three. Do you patch your neighbor's network computers to avoid malware infestation while you borrow their wireless bandwidth? <laughs> the answer was... So, do you love your uh, laptop more than you love your significant other? Do you love your laptop more than you love your significant other? Which, which number? Which number? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no? Mm. All right. Sorry. She just wants to answer. No. Okay. <laughs> number five. Pay attention here. Because you could have done this when you were drunk and you might not remember. But that's not an excuse. Um, have, you ever, have you ever tried to get a picture with Jim Christie? Oh, Look me in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> that she remembers, Jim. Do you remember? No, no I don't remember Not shit. <laughs> uh, number six. Okay, this is a hard one. How many episodes of Star Trek did Will Wheaton kiss a girl? Me. Okay, we're going to vote. Who thinks number one is the lamer? Cheer, clap. Nobody. Okay. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Number six. Number five. <laughs> Number six. Okay, number one, number four, and number five, and six can sit down. Okay, we've narrowed it down. All right, another round of questions. Number, now it's one and two, okay? One, do you have a three and a half inch floppy? Are you inviting me to that? you like to say that? Sarah? Where's Sarah? Oh, it, it, it. good. Number two, would you use an ATM at DEF CON? No. Barry, use the mic. All right, uh, number one, what reading material do you keep in your bathroom? Reading material, magazines. Yeah, I'm here for it. It's all in the 
very good. Trent, it's, it's on the op-ed. Right. Number two, would you prefer, prefer to go out with a hot chick or play World of Warcraft? Hot chick. <laughs> Tom. <laughs> Go <get game>. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Is your idea of a social event a land party? <laughs> All right. Number two. Uh, name at least five Intel x86. Machine instructions. That's enough. Next one. Uh, <laughs> Actually, program and stuff. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hey, no help. No uh, help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hop. Uh, number one. Have you ever purchased virtual gold or virtual weapons? With real money. <laughs> Last question, Chris. Uh, number two. For you to be up during the day, would you have to move to Tokyo? For you to be awake during the day, would you have to move to Tokyo? <laughs> okay, this is the final vote. Number one. I'm not yeah. sure I have to ask any more flipping questions. Number two. Okay, number one, you can have a seat. Number two, if you would come up here, please. We'd like to present you with the uh, coveted Spot the Lamer t-shirt. Says, uh, Feds, feds burn another one at DEF CON 18. I also have a coin for you. If you would walk in. All the feds have uh, swag for you. Badge. Thank you. Challenge coin patch. Thank you. Come on, you This is a coin unit, and this is a cyber operator. This is, this is the coveted <laughs> National White Collar Crime Center pocket protector. <laughs> Newton, take your hands out of your pockets. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> we, also, we also have a vacation. All right, anybody else want to play some more contests? <laughs> okay, uh, this year we, we've uh, been allotted two tracks. So the first track uh, is to deal with uh, criminal cases and forensics and that kind of stuff. So we've got mostly law enforcement guys up here. Uh, at one o'clock we have another panel to talk about cyber strategies and policies. So if you'd come back at uh, one o'clock for that. Thanks, Priest. Sure, please. So the runners up, thank you for participating in the community. Please come see me afterwards. We have some for you as well. Not an arrest, but. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Priest. Uh, we have armed all our uh, uh, panelists with our coveted bullshit flags. So if we think your question is bullshit, we're going to let you know. If uh, we think the, the uh, answers are bullshit, we're also going to wave our flag. So, you know, cheering is allowed. Uh, now we're going to just do a quick introduction and then we're going to open it up to questions and we've got a microphone down here uh, in the center aisle. The center aisle. This aisle. <laughs> okay, I'm Jim Christie from the Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center. Uh, was a special agent with Air Force Office Special Investigation for about 24 years. Been a computer crime investigator the whole time. John. Tom, in the interest of keeping this brief, I'm going to set the stage. I'm John Garris. Uh, I run the NASA Computer Crimes Division. We catch hackers. Over to you. Very good. 
My name is Barry Grundy. I'm a uh, assistant special agent in charge of the Treasury Department's uh, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. In brief, because I know that's uh, not familiar to a lot of people, we o oversee uh, tax threats to tax administration internally and externally for the IRS. My name is Trent Tyma. I'm with the FBI. I run the uh, National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force, and I want to thank you for the job security. <laughs> My name is Tom Talor. I'm a retired NASA executive. I built the original Computer Crimes Division at the NASA Inspector General's Office, and uh, I've been retired for about 10 years. I had 31 years in federal law enforcement. Good morning. I'm Colonel Mike Camartino with the U.S. Air Force. I'm commander of the 318th Information Operations Group. My group uh, performs uh, reverse engineering, malware analysis, intrusion detection, and, um, and also um, provides defensive mechanisms, custom government-only defensive mechanisms to, pr uh, to protect uh, U.S. Air Force and DOD networks. Mike, uh, before you pass it on, uh, are you recruiting this year? We are. Um, we have a large number of jobs that remain unfilled. Uh, we need good talent, um, and we don't really turn anybody away. Even, even when people have maybe uh, stepped across the line, we redirect them to our... Yeah, we don't turn anybody away who crosses the line. We yeah. have a special line for them. Well, yeah. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's part of my deal, too. I, I actually have no authority to arrest you, and I'm not interested in arresting you. <laughs> I'm here to recruit you. So come see me after. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm Bob Hopper with the National White Collar Crime Center. Um, we teach state and local law enforcement uh, computer forensics. And as a side note, I've been coming here four years, so I usually fly in on Monday and we do this and fly out on Saturday or Sunday. Um, I'm 32 years old. This, so this is what this will do to you. Loud, Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Mitchell. I'm a civilian member with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, I help develop forensic software for our tech crime program. Okay. Uh, we need questions. This is, uh, this is all for you guys. So line up. Let's have some questions. Come on, come on. STS Endeavor Mission Metal. For someone who asked a good question, to be ter determined later, of course. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I heard. I just heard recently that the the mastermind behind uh, the Mariposa botnet was just taken down. Do you guys have any information on that? Uh, yeah, the Slovenian police arrested them Tuesday. Um, uh, the Spanish police arrested a few other people. I think early this summer along with stuff that we did uh, domestically, yeah, that just happened. Nobody's behind you. You got a second question? Okay. Line up, guys, if you have questions. Do you folks communicate with each other on problems, issues? How the hell do you think they got here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, at work. In other words, do you do, are there interagency connections between you guys? For everything, or is it just certain? Items? No, we don't talk to each other at all. <laughs> I've never met these people in my life. <laughs> yes, we do. We have. We, there, there are a lot of working groups and task forces that work on various uh, cybercrime issues, in particular. Um, the IGs, the Treasury Inspector General, and um, for Tax Administration, and the NASA IG, the smaller uh, computer crimes unit, actually do rely on each other on the FBI and some of the larger uh, agencies very much for intelligence and support in the field. So yes, there is a, there's a so lot of So does this carry to local areas? In other words, like sheriff's departments and police, you know, city police forces and Actually, so Actually, yes, it does. And it's US-wide then? Yes. Okay. Thank it's you. actually international, international, not just US. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you notice the Royal Canadian Man of Police? They come from Canada. <laughs> Hello. Um, how do you guys really feel about the Cyber Command, and why aren't they here today? 
Uh, no, Cyber Command's here. You just don't know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, um, the, the Air Force and every service has a component that it offers, uh, forces that it offers to Cyber Command. So when you say Cyber Command is not here, uh, I, I guess I'm effectively their representative. So if you have, have any questions, let me know. <laughs> you can probably spot 12 if you want. Um, like this field has been pioneered by people who have been breaking the law. Now, when I was like, you know, going through my training and all that, the message was that in order to stop this behavior, we have to stop hiring the uh, people who are violating the systems that we're building. Now, what I just heard is that, you know, you're looking for people and you're not too worried about the fact that lines have been crossed. Has is that a shift again in uh, the industry position? Well, I'm the one who said uh, that I didn't mind people crossing the line. But uh, remember, these guys are law enforcement guys, so they do care if you cross the line. <laughs> um, but I'm not. Um, uh, what, I will ha what I will do is, e even after you've paid your debt to society, uh, <laughs> in terms of these guys, we, we kind of direct people to our support contractors. So people can do white world uh, research, unclassified research, on all, all sorts of malware. And, uh, and, and still contribute, you know, to, to the Air Force and the defense of the country. So to to be able to work uh, for any one of our agencies, you're going to probably have to get a clearance. And there'll be a background investigation. So if you have broken the law in probably the last five years, that will probably eliminate you for, for a period of time. If you've stayed clean for five years, you're probably going to be eligible for, and depending on how severe uh, a crime you committed so you know it's dependent and there has to be a period of time where you're 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 clean anybody else well yeah on that I mean if you're elite I want to talk to you I mean it doesn't matter and we may not be able to give you a TSSCI clearance but I still want to talk to you so. hi working in the uh, private space with consumer protection, with a lot of the threats that are out today, fake antivirus, phishing, things like that, it's been very hard to get law enforcement engagement for, you know, hey, somebody just lost 50 bucks over there, where at scale, it's billions of dollars, but it's just in all these little drips. What are your thoughts on how law enforcement can get a better handle on that, and how can private industry interface better with law enforcement to ultimately get prosecution? So, the National White Collar Crime Center and the FBI have a facility in West, by God, Virginia, called the Internet Crime Complaint Center. Um, and we take complaints online from victims, and we don't really care whether you, you lost five bucks or 500 bucks. Um, the FBI is, does a really, really good job of doing analysis on those cases and following up um, with those investigations that meet their threshold. What we do uh, with our analysts from our side of that is um, take those cases that don't meet the FBI threshold, uh, do some analysis on those cases, and hand those off with that analysis to both sides of the jurisdiction. So the jurisdiction that that's got the victim in the jurisdiction that's got the suspect. And we put those two investigations together. Um, Just we had a conversation about this yesterday about ISPs and <clears throat> uh, credit card companies and various other people that are involved in, in the fraud chain uh, retaining data. Because what we find is that that person that lost $20 that normally wouldn't have their case investigated might be part of um, a fraud that, that's a million dollar fraud once you cobble all those cases together. So once they're aggregated and codified into one single investigation, that victim might actually get some satisfaction. So what you commonly hear is that person has reported a crime and they might not think it got investigated when in fact it did and the case was filed as a large fraud case. They just weren't uh, called to testify. Uh, 
so they actually might not know that that the case I actually got investigated yeah to piggyback on what hop was saying we we benefited from the IC triple uh, triple C's work Internet Crime Complaint Center uh, on a Nigerian case where NASA was victimized but it wasn't quite at the level that uh, was enticing to uh, many US attorneys offices particularly in the larger jurisdictions like uh, Washington DC New York we go there we found out that our guy was directly associated with uh, over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars of lost complaints and we know that's just a fraction of the damage that he's done that tipped the scale and got people interested and we ended up arresting him and he spent a year and a half in Nigerian prison I think that's a pretty good a pretty good uh, outcome so so the complaint center um, the number of complaints has just grown phenomenally over the last uh, three or four years I think last year we we we're bumping a million complaints a year. Uh, we also put in a, uh, we wrote a program that uh, it's called ISIS that uh, helps state and local law enforcement uh, with the analysis and cobbling together of those cases. It gives them the ability to communicate back and forth uh, from both sides of that, from the suspect side and the, and the victim side. Uh, and it's uh, it actually works pretty well and that was an excellent question and I will give you this pocket protector <laughs> knowing that you can put this on eBay and probably make as much as two dollars <laughs> hop, hop will even autograph that for you for, for you guys that are standing in the back there are seats up here in the front and we got your picture back there anyway, so you might as well come on up. All right, the next good question is the STS Endeavor Medal. It's for you, man. I can see it. Cybersecurity Act of 2009. I'd like to hear the panel's opinion and their position. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? <laughs> the Cybersecurity Act of 2009, your position, you could just go for or against. Uh, we're law enforcement. We enforce the law. I mean, the Congress uh, did a great job making the yeah. law. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we gotta have jobs when we go home, you know. I was just wondering if the uh, the current position towards the uh, the classified networks. Do you think that it it actively does enough, assuming that since it is a closed network? that uh, security features don't need to be as strict or stigs don't need to be as enforced? I'm not sure I agree. Um, <laughs> Mike, you, you look like you're chomping there. So, um, I mean, the, your, your question is uh, a little nondescript, but okay. as, as far as um, Security, you're asking about security on our secured networks? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or classified networks? Well, we're not going to really talk about that too much. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Fair enough. Fair enough. But, um, you know, I mean, certainly the posture on, on uh, secured networks is uh, at or above um, what you might expect to see on our, on our unclassified networks, just because of their criticality, um, the value of, of the information. And, uh, and the fact that, frankly, some of the information on those networks could get people killed if, if it was revealed. So it's, it's really important, um, you know, that we, we make sure those systems are protected as, as best we can. I mean, that's a pretty, you know, generic answer, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious from that. This could be considered a follow-on. Uh, what's the latest excuse for the leakage of 96,000 classified documents from the secured network? I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. It just takes one stupid motherfucker. That's, that's a human problem. One lion? Motherfucker with no integrity. That's all it takes. That is 
Well said. Well said. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why we have a lot of feds. In the uh, criminal cases that you guys are working on, um, are there any statute of limitations in the crimes that you're that they're being committed? Depending on the crime, there are statutes of limitations that you know you'd be outside the scope. But it actually, what so you, so you did the crime, did the hack, at, say in the 90s, and we didn't find out about it. It actually the clock starts ticking when we discover it and start working the case. So it depends. So as long as you're working on the case, it's it's. A, it's but there incredible. there are statute of limitations depending on what the violation is. If you don't, what you're actually going to charge with. If you don't gather enough evidence to complete it, it you can talk it. to me later afterwards, and I'll be happy to. That's an interesting question. Do you have a specific date? Yeah. Um, <laughs> do, yeah. Nothing. Nothing specific. You want to cut through the bullshit and just confess right here? <laughs> you guys talked about uh, working groups between agencies and, and sharing information. Um, what about? Um, what opportunities are there with private sector and working with law enforcement as private sector are exposed to the same threats oftentimes and they might have visibility that could benefit law enforcement and then law enforcement could also provide information to the private sector to help protect their networks. There seems to be a little bit of a um, information gap in some of the sharing that goes on between those two. There is, but we're working on it. So. What we do every day uh, is, is work with state and local law enforcement, and in some cases, federal law enforcement. Uh, part of our job, we, we have the ability to kind of wear the government hat and the private sector hat because we're a nonprofit. Uh, so we work real closely with people like Cisco and Symantec and Mantec and, and uh, McAfee and, and on and on and on. And, and we do just exactly what you're asking about. We bring those experts from those entities to the table with law enforcement experts and uh, identify from both sides the gaps as best we can. Do you also and work with private companies other than the commercial absolutely. security? We do, yes, we do. Uh, I, th I think all, often. The, all the panelists up here, we actually have tight relationship with private companies, you know, not just infrastructures, not the big companies, stuff like that, because that's the only way you find out what's going on out on the net is actually building those uh, relationships yeah. and uh, speed of trust. It's in, commonly done. Yeah. In the Department of Defense, we have a pilot program where we're actually sharing with a critical infrastructure, the, the cleared contractors, the defense industrial base, classified threat information uh, to protect their, their network. So we are sharing classified information uh, in this particular pilot program. Is there an opportunity for private industry to become classified or not non-contractors to be able to obtain that threat information under some sort of vetted community? Well, that's a policy question you should hold for DHS in the second panel. That'd be perfect. I'll just shift gears a little bit. On the Internet Gaming Enforcement Act, there's a lot of the servers that are affected by that are overseas, and I was curious about your approach to enforcement on overseas gaming resources. And second, the follow-up to that, are you going to come after my Poker Stars bankroll? Yeah, we'll seize that. that. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to seize that. Um, now, are you talking? Are you talking like online gaming? Yeah, you know, the online like, gaming. The online gaming act that that is in Congress. Right. The, the the one thing with online gaming is obviously it's a very it's a challenged one to enforce and two because where the servers are you know, around the world or, uh, you know, protection. So that, that actually uh, there has been some looks at, uh, looking at it, the department's looked at it, but it's, it, it is a challenge. I mean, we're, that's, that's a hard one to enforce. Is it a, just a jurisdiction challenge or is it a, a challenge that they're just, they're sovereign countries? Well, I think sovereign. it's more a jurisdiction and sovereign countries because that, that, uh, that creates the problem where your servers are overseas. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you guys know who the video professor is? <laughs> the free um, trials? I only recently discovered that if you get the free trial, because my grandparents asked me about this, and um, after 10 days of getting, after you get the CD, if you don't send it back, they're going to charge your credit card $200, and that's obviously a scam. But the small print is on the website, 
So what do you guys, if anything, can you do about shady, gray area, stuff like that? Well, uh, he, he's working for us out of Area 51. <laughs> Actually, in that uh, gray area, the, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, has some uh, authorities and powers to address. That, that's where I would uh, suggest you direct the complaint. In those gray areas where there's no clear violation of law, and actually with your state attorney general's office, seriously, with that, bring it up because the, the, the state might have problems with that more than the federal government. Right, right. Thanks. So, uh, this one's for my northern brother on the end here. Um, you said you were a developer? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and no offense to you, I was just wondering why didn't the RCMP or CISA send an investigator? Why did they send a developer? They're standing in line behind you. Pardon me? They're standing in line behind you. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, well, part of the reason I'm here is actually to, to attend some of the conferences and learn a lot. So I guess they thought maybe I would be able to take away a, a significant portion from that, I hope. So you got the short straw. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. That's cool. From a law enforcement standpoint, uh, it's come out in several reports that the majority of the uh, hosting services that have spam and other malicious activities taking place actually exist in the United States. Uh, much of these activities are somewhat illegal and detrimental to our overall security and well-being. What, if anything, is law enforcement able to do or doing to assist in shutting down uh, many of these hosting services? that have these uh, spam and other malicious activities taking place? Well, actually, we've uh, realized some success working with uh, the FBI, Secret Service. Uh, how many people have heard of Mercolo? Um Mercolo actually was taken offline by their upstream providers because there was just a storm of complaints for such a period of time. Uh, ultimately, we got a search warrant, which totally brought down their systems. A review of the data realized, uh, revealed the fact that they were uh, opening up other uh, bulletproof hosts. Uh, I mentioned the FTC. Uh, as you might imagine, a lot of the criminal element that's using these these uh, 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 rogue ISPs, they're operating them are overseas, and we may not have a multilateral assistance treaty or any type of treaty for extradition. Uh, so, in, in that particular instance, on 3FN, Pricewort, uh, the other bulletproof hosts, quote unquote, we partnered with the FTC, and they have authorities for seizure. Uh, when it's clear, uh, we provided evidence as long as, uh, along with other uh, IT security researchers, University of Alabama, Spam House, etc. A lot of people that the community really worked in this instance. They provided enough evidence for the FTC to go under their authorities of forfeiture, apply for that, and the judge uh, ruled in the favor. So basically, shut shut their entire ISP down, uh, and they also have a, a one million dollar fine on top of that. So in this particular instance. We extracted some pain from the people providing the rest of us pain. It's not the perfect solution, particularly for the law enforcement folks. We want to see people in cuffs, but it's better than nothing. Okay, and going to an earlier comment you made about the Mariposa botnet uh, takedown, uh, it sounded like you said it was a legal thing, but was it not actually led by a commercial entity to actually take down the botnet itself and then followed up by other legal action? And now applying that standard to other botnets around the world, are we, are we going to have to look at commercial entities going after these things rather than actual law enforcement uh, rendering some type of service to uh, take these botnets down? I, I think to answer your question, it's more that, uh, yeah, we're going to have to work. Uh, it's a bigger problem. It's not just the law enforcement or feds and raid jackets coming out. It's going to be a community um, working together to bring down these things. Given Let me, let me just quickly follow up on that. I'm aware of three cases just in California where there might be some people in this room that helped out on them, but <laughs> I would expect there probably is. But but uh, it was a true partnership between people in the industry, um, basically collecting the evidence uh, and handing it off to the right people. And it was the FBI and FTC. And and uh, in one one case, uh, they chased uh, a bad guy through uh, three ISPs, finally completely got him shut down. But uh, a lot of, the bulk of that work was done by by people in the industry. Uh, so the great partnership. Law enforcement, 
certainly at the state and local level, don't have the capacity uh, to impact that kind of problem. I mean, that's truly just uh, if the FBI and the U.S. Secret Service, uh, some other federal agencies weren't there, it wouldn't get impacted at all. Given that there's been a modicum of success in prosecuting cyber criminals, not the big ones, and that the uh, cyber crime is not taken as seriously, not as sensational as, say, a bank robbery in person, and that the uh, district attorneys are forced to use archaic laws in establishing jur jurisdiction and account access. Do you see a point in time where the cyber laws, both in this country and internationally, catch up with the cyber, the cyber crime as it happens? I certainly hope so. <laughs> so it may be coming from another direction. So the, the Department of Justice just uh, three weeks ago announced the formation of uh, a number of intellectual property task forces around the country. So uh, some of that's driven by cyber and some of it's not. Um, but that product uh, that, that has a nexus to cyber is uh, probably going to get impacted by those task forces. Um, I see hope on the horizon just because it's on the it's on the president's uh, agenda, uh, you know, in the top five probably. To address your question a little bit differently, I spent a lot of time in the 90s, uh, in earlier, working to develop all the cyber laws we have now with the Department of Justice, and a lot of people like me did. In the United States, we have very robust laws. Ironically some of the uh, civil liberties built into our cyber laws are stronger than those that are built into our corporeal space laws that existed before cyberspace. The issue for all of us that work in this field and worked in this field is these cases are international in nature and we're slammed 18 hours a day working them. The operational tempo is very large. Mm -hmm. And so when you work with nations overseas that either don't have these laws, don't care, uh, or have ethics issues with their, their good governance issues, uh, you combine all those issues, since these cases are international in nature, it becomes more difficult. It doesn't become a U.S. legal issue to resolve them. You have to work through these international issues. You've got to keep in mind, overt acts taken on the part of anybody, not just a nation state, can constitute an act of war in cyberspace. So um, we're, good, we're in good shape in the U.S., but in other countries it's not quite that way. Okay, thank you. What well, I'm going to follow up on that. Um, dirty little secret is that the number one cyber crime in the world it has nothing to do with intrusions. You know, it's child pornography. And so the limited resources that uh, federal, state, and local law enforcement have, a great deal of those resources are put to uh, 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 the predators that are preying on children. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, especially at the state and local level, intrusions aren't looked at. It's a matter of resources. Uh, what are the panel's views on the U.S. government's desire or capability to shut down the Internet in the, in the event of a cyber attack? I think there are two bills currently in the Congress that are being considered. That's it? That's it. How it's fortunate. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. The question I've got is, who's the lead federal agency for a large-scale cyber attack? You know, who would take uh, command and control during a large-scale cyber attack, such as something against uh, critical infrastructure, more than one area? So, just example, healthcare, transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Probably the FBI. So, I mean, it, really, it, really, it, it, it depends on how it comes in. I mean, if you have, like, when I, when I was at NASA, we had 24-hour-a-day surveillance of our networks, and sometimes we were the major victim. If we were the major victim, we would have the lead in the matter because we had the corporate knowledge, we had the infrastructure and the resources in the area. But as we're watching attacks come across the line, often we'd see the Department of Agriculture, or the Department of Commerce, or IBM as a victim. We don't have jurisdiction to, invest, to investigate uh, incidents in those departments. We either have to refer to the matter to those departments if they have cyber investigative resources or not. The FBI has jurisdiction across the government and they could go in and handle an issue, for example, in one of these other departments that we don't have jurisdiction in. So in a situation like uh, a Titan rain, re you know, redo, uh, in other words, you know, attack against, let's say, uh, defense or you know, another agency that is outside of 
the networks, you know, controlled by the Department of Justice. What you're talking about is a team sport, yeah. and that's why everybody's up here. Uh, the FBI leads the National Cyber Investigative uh, uh, Task Force uh, for that reason. Everybody here just about is at that table plus, you know, and it's a team sport, divide and conquer. Everybody has, everybody's a censor today. So when you're attacked, you got to gather the information from all the different censors and analyze it. And, you know, it's definitely a team sport today. The people in the individual agencies that are law enforcement officers, like I was at NASA or when I was with the NCIS or the Defense Criminal Investigative Service, we're supposed to have vast vertical knowledge of what's going on in that department because that's something the FBI just can't have. They've got too many things to do uh, going laterally across the U.S. nation's uh, law enforcement effort. So when you combine these vertical and lateral approaches, you hopefully get the type of team support you need to get things done. And that's what we try to do. This question is for the two NASA gentlemen on the, on the panel. Um, I've worked on a lot of DOD networks and, and I know that it's really difficult in the NASA organization based on the uh, uh, leadership style of NASA different from the other DOD uh, networks. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak to maybe two different uh, items. One is on an enterprise level, how do you uh, protect the uh, individual machines? Because we know that the border is as safe as it can be, but most of the users are inviting the bad guys in. And so how do you detect uh, the individual machines on the uh, downside end? What kind of tools are you going to put in? And what do you think the next best thing uh, coming out of NIST will be to help with that? Well, I'll let John answer what's going on at NASA presently, and I'll be glad to add a historical perspective after that. Um, with regard to the, the approach with NASA, first of all, NASA has uh, several missions. The uh, human spaceflight mission, I'm proud to report so far, knock on wood, uh, is pretty locked down. The science mission, on the other hand, by statute, is required to share data with the public. And they do that through a, a, an extensive association with the educational institutions, not just in the U.S., but across the globe. So the attack surface for NASA is significantly higher than many of your uh, U.S. agencies. Uh, that's not an excuse that, that it is what it is. Uh, and also gives us a lot of business. Uh, quite frankly. Um, but as far as uh, the approach for uh, locking down the networks, I mean, we're, the, the agency is trying to do what everyone else is doing, a defense in depth approach, which is the only way it's going to work. Um, I'm, hopefully that, that answered your question. Well, I was just wondering if there was any enterprise tools that you were going to be introducing to, to help you with that. Uh, the, the CIO's office, which I can't speak for directly, is deploying various tools for an enterprise-wide approach. Can't endorse anything here. Um, yeah, there was an article, uh, I think a, a couple months ago, um, from a Canadian university that identified a covert channels, um, I guess, hacking the Indian, Indian, Indian Ministry of Defense for a number of years. Um, my question to you guys is that, are there um, like contacts, uh, you know, who would we start with on, on your guys' side? Um, to communicate if we thought there was some kind of a covert channel going on from our company um, to kind of start that process for identifying if in fact that you know is the case um, and you know how there was another I, I went to a, a security event where they um, the, the presenter was a was a private com a security company that said there was upwards of 80 percent of the corporations out there had some kind of a root kit uh, in them um, and that you know these kind of channels are quite common and whether or not they're being used is is the other thing you know they might not be used uh, the best thing to do if you want to report it is get to know your friendly neighborhood FBI agent and uh, bring that to them so you can so start with there. the FBI start with the FBI or any of the any people on the panel I mm -hmm. mean if the company's affiliated with doing defense contractor Absolutely. work they want to talk and if it's the Air Force work talk to the Air Force right. OSI yeah. if it's NASA work talk to NASA, NASA. there's yeah. a lot of places they can go it just depends upon if it's a pure commercial business and commercial fraud, right. commercial issue involved, the FBI would be most likely your uh, best best call on that. And do you guys see that or work with those people, um, those kind of you know events? Um, do you actually time. see that happen every day, all every the time. Day. Yeah, yeah, every day. Thanks. Unfortunately, this is going to be the last question, guys. We're out of time, so I'll make it very down. short. Thank you. Um, most likely, it's more directed toward DHS, but. Um, uh, 
uh, I want to have your viewpoint and opinion on this. With the critical importance of the net, I understand the argument to network shaping and traffic control of ISPs and the government uh, influence in that. Um, but uh, in lieu of protection of the First Amendment rights and equal access to the network, as it's so important to our lives, what is your response to network neutrality uh, considering that P2P is under scrutiny and now that P2P is actually being used by commercial vendors um, and also the issue brought to light uh, by the Shadow Factory. It's a book that talks I, a lot I about I suffer things. from ADD. Can you like shorten that up? Okay. <laughs> well, sure. We have trouble hearing you. If you speak up and make it shorter because we're living on Sorry time. about that. Just give us a quick question because we're short on time. What is your viewpoint on net neutrality? Well, I'm an old timer and I was brought up on the internet and command line Unix way back working cybercrime cases, you know, 79, 80 time frame. So I kind of believe in the old internet. Personally speaking for myself, I like it. I don't like all this regulatory oversight, uh, uh, personally speaking. I'm retired, I can say any fucking thing I want to. Thank you. And I mean, the real problem you have in this country is, it's very interesting, we live in a constitutional republic, but we have vast laws that criminalize just about everything. Yeah. And so you've got this conflict between openness versus security in, a, in democracy, and it's a difficult issue. Thank you. I, I want to encourage everyone up there, because I understand your difficult jobs, but to press forward with net neutrality, because honestly, that's the way we're going to make U.S. stay the U.S. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Don't forget, we have another Meet the Fed panel on policy uh, at 1 o'clock right here. Uh, we do have a couple of bullshit flags left. <laughs> okay, and also, we're going to take these fine folks right across the hall to room 111, so if you were online and did not get your question answered, they will be able to do it over there. And please exit to the right. There you go.